Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. To start. So, my name is uh, Olivier Grisel. So, I'm a software engineer uh, at INRIA. So, it's a French research institute. My team is working on brain imaging data analysis for like statistical analysis of the brain activity to try and understand how the brain works. Uh, and part of this team, uh, this team is uh, using uh, Python uh, quite heavily for our research and they needed uh, machine learning tools. Uh, and so instead of writing their own neuroimaging specific machine learning toolkit, they started the scikit-learn project like four or five years ago, more, more than that, um, and made it open source and kept the uh, neuroimaging stuff out of the library so that uh, we have a generic machine learning library nowadays. Um, so this is how the project has started, but now nowadays there are many contributors uh, from all around the world uh, working on this and they have different backgrounds in, in machine learning for text classification, computer vision, or just machine learning in general, or biology, astronomy, or any, any kind of uh, application domain. Um, <coughs> so the, the outline of this talk um, is, um, first, how many people here are not familiar with machine learning? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll go quickly ab about that step, and uh, then um, I'll, I'll present the scikit-learn uh, project as an open source project. So how it is structured, how people collaborate to, to make it work. Uh, I will give you an, an overview of some of the users. Um, and then introduce uh, some uh, new stuff that was released in uh, 0.15 uh, release, which was uh, released uh, this summer in uh, late July. And then I will go through a, a demo of uh, the IPython notebook combined with Pandas and scikit-learn to make an interactive data modeling en environment. So machine learning and predictive modeling is how to find the, the structure of the data. So an example is um, uh, collect some data on housing. For instance, if you are a very re real estate agency, you have different kind of columns with different types, categories, integers, uh, floating point values, booleans. And y y in general, you have uh, one specific column of interest that you want to find the relationship between that column and, and the first columns. So in machine learning parlance, uh, the rows of this database are called the samples, and the columns are called the, the features, and uh, the target column is called the target variable, target column. Um, and usually, uh, your data set has some historical data that we use to train the model, and you are interested in applying what you've trained, what you've learned on the historical data to make predictions uh, on the future data that you collect. So for instance, if you are a relate, uh, real estate agency, let me try this. So this might be like the, the historical uh, transaction prices that you observed in, in, your, in your activity. And here might be new prospective customers, and they might go on your website and enter a short description uh, of the, the housing that they want to sell, and you want to have your website uh, make an instantaneous uh, estimation of, uh, of the selling price uh, as a service for your customers, for instance. Um, so the, the generic data flow for predictive modeling is to start from, from the raw data, so you have many samples, uh, that can be training uh, documents uh, for uh, text documents, images, uh, sound recordings, or uh, some kind of structured data from a database, like a, a log of transactions from a telco uh, company, for instance. And you have your, your target, va target variables, so we call them labels. So for each individual rows, <coughs> row in, in this database, you have a, a target value. Or for each um, uh, text document, you know whether it's spam or not spam, or something like this. So the first stage is to extract uh, a numerical representation of this original uh, data, and that is normalized enough uh, so that you can apply any kind of generic machine learning algorithm onto it. And so this uh, feature extraction step 
uh, is very important and most of the time this is where uh, data science uh, uh, fail or success and then you can you can try uh, different kind of machine learning algorithm and by using cross validation evaluate the, the quality of the model uh, that uh, will be outputted by uh, by uh, running it on, on the feature vectors and then in the, uh, in the production pipeline uh, you can reuse that model to apply it to uh, new feature vectors that were extracted in the same way from new data that has no labels because you haven't labeled it yet it comes from the production servers so this arrow here should be exactly the same as the operation computed by this arrow and then the model will out output the prediction and sometimes a confidence level or probability or something like this um, so there are applications in business I think you are aware of it there are application applications in, in science um, and so I'll skip that <laughs> So uh, now uh, let's talk about uh, Scikit-learn, uh, the, the project. So it's a library of uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, it's uh, meant to be used by Python developers, Python programmers. Uh, it's mostly written in Python itself uh, by using an uh, external project called uh, NumPy and SciPy. So NumPy is primarily a data structure for manipulating n-dimensional arrays like MATLAB does, for instance, uh, and provides some basic linear algebra operations, matrix multiplications, stuff like that. Uh, SciPy is kind of a, a, another layer on top of NumPy that provides optimization routines. Uh, some of them are written in Fortran, statistical uh, sampling uh, tools. Uh, there are many other tools uh, for signal processing and uh, sparse matrix representation and operations and so on. Uh, finally, uh, scikit-learn is also uh, built upon uh, a, a tool which is called Cyton, which is basically uh, an extended Python syntax uh, that has static types declarations like integers, float, arrays and whatever. And Cyton <coughs> will uh, translate your Cyton program into a C program that can get compiled into a Python extension. So it, it makes it possible to write code that is all looks very similar to Python code, but can run at the speed of uh, a C program without having any kind of uh, Python overhead. Um, so when you really want to optimize Python code, you have to add a lot of declarations. So at the end, it doesn't look like Python code anymore. It looks more like C, but it's less boilerplate than writing C directly. Yeah, uh, yeah, and also, yeah, there is a uh, limitation in Python uh, when you want to use threads uh, for uh, leveraging several CPUs on, on, a, on a single machine. Uh, the Python interpreter has a lock, uh, which is called the GIL, and uh, so if you want to use um, uh, multiple threads, uh, you can write site on code and, and uh, release that lock and, and run uh, thread efficiently on, on several CPUs. Yes. I want to ask about the license. So, oh, at the open source workshop, yes. it seemed like BSD was predominant, except for Shogun, who's doing GPL. W why did you choose BSD? Uh, so, we chose uh, BSD for scikit-learn because the whole Python, NumPy, SciPy stack is BSD or MIT, so mm -hmm. uh, non viral uh, licenses. Uh, and mm -hmm. that makes it much easier to uh, to make to adopt by organizations because you don't have to ask a lawyer because people are afraid of GPL and sometimes they are right to be afraid. Can <laughs> correctly continue yeah. on. Uh, yes. This is Anaconda already has some plugin on Scikit-learn that are proprietary, proprietary, right? Yes. So there there are, there are companies who build uh, proprietary software on top of Python and NumPy and whatever. So, but we don't care. <laughs> they can do if they want. Um, so yes, we don't we don't want to be viral. We want to have maximum adoption, and, uh, and don't want to have to talk to lawyers. Um, just to do a release or whatever. So the uh, the so w one of the, the 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 scope of the of this library is to focus on uh, established methods. We don't try to replicate the latest papers. Uh, from the literature, we try to wait a couple of years, like five years, and see uh, the citation counts of, of the papers to make sure that there are actual 
uh, useful methods and not just something that is good on one benchmark and, and not replicate, cannot be replicated or is just deprecated by a new method. For instance, we don't have uh, deep learning models <laughs> because the state of the art changes every three months. So, <laughs> so um, but we focus on established methods like uh, linear models. We penalize linear models for classification regression or uh, decision trees uh, in ensembles like random forest or boosted trees and so on. And one of the most important selling point of the library is to try to cast all those models into a single uh, very simple homogeneous API um, that so all the estimators are in the model uh, provide a method called fit that takes the data as an input. Uh, so the data is an empire array or scipy sparse matrix or a pandas data frame. Uh, and then you can, uh, the model will update itself and then you can call uh, a predict or transform uh, to output the prediction or to cast, to project the data into a new space. Um, and we also provide um, model assessment tools and uh, model selection tools and uh, ways to build ensembles of uh, basic models. So the, to have an overview of how the API looks like, so uh, all models in scikit-learn are Python classes. So in this case, this is the support vector classifier from a libsvm, which is wrapped. So it's uh, written in C++ and we just patched it to make it possible to use the dense data representation uh, to directly map to NumPy arrays. And we also support uh, sparse uh, representation, but in that case, it does a, a copy, unfortunately. Um, and so the, uh, this class, you instantiate it and you pass just hyperparameters as uh, keyword arguments to, to the uh, constructor. And then you can call fit and x, a, uh, x train is expected to be a two dimensional NumPy array. Uh, with the feature values, so in general it's floating point values. And Y is the target variable, so it can be a one-dimensional array for uh, multi-class classification if you use integers for encoding the classes, or it can be a two-dimensional arrays with zero and one for uh, one at encoding of uh, multi-label or multi-class uh, classification. For regression, it can be a uh, floating point values. Um, and then, do yes. Do you do cost instead classification? Well, sorry? Do you do cost instead classification? Uh, cost as it is like a sample so weight? Like think about multi class where the different classes have different costs associated with them? Uh, nope. Uh, so, no. I don't think we have any model that does that. And then, does every model, is it, does every model support the same kinds of labels? Or, or is it, there's the, the label types only like. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some models yeah. will support multi-class, for example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it depends on the models. <coughs> so some models are fundamentally regression models. So if you want to cast this as a classification model, you can wrap it into another Python class that will do the one versus all reduction for you, for instance. Uh, and some models are multi-output, like a ridge regression. You can do a regression of different output efficiently by using a single model. And uh, for instance, decision trees can also do uh, multi-class classification and multi-output multi-class classification natively. So, but it really depends on the mathematical st structures of the models and also depends on the implementation. Sometimes, even if it's possible from a mathematical point of view for implementation reasons, we decided not to implement everything, basically. Um, Quick question. Yes? Do, uh, so the question is, do we have to declare the type of the output labels? Uh, so it, basically, you, 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 you forge your data as NumPy arrays the way you want, and they are typed. So a, a, a NumPy array has a data type. So it can be floating point, 32-bit, 64-bit, or integers, or complex values, if you want. Uh, but most of the models, if they, if they get uh, uh, an empire array with the, a type that is not the, their own natural type, they will try to convert the data if there is a, a natural cast, and if there is no cast, they will just raise an exception. So it's dynamic uh, programming language, so the type is dynamic, it's a definite runtime. My experience with scikit-learn is that it's incredibly robust. I mean, 
have as long as y x train and y train have the same first dimension yes. to work, and it makes educated inference. And, uh, and sometimes was tricked by the educated inference. Like yeah. the labels, you put a big vector where you want to suggest some kind of multi-class decomposition. No, it's going to do it different. It's going to do a unique and do its own decomposition. Yes. So, and sometimes it does something that you're not expecting. <laughs> And that can be tricky. So it's really important to read the documentation to see what it's expecting, what is the most natural uh, representation that it will accept. And uh, I know that sometimes the error message that you get if your data doesn't fit those ass assumptions might not be always uh, very clear. So we are trying to improve that over the time. You're using a, like a structured numpy array with multiple types. Yes. What happens? So uh, the, the question is, about uh, using uh, structured NumPy arrays that have different types for different columns, for instance. Uh, right now, I think it's just rejected. Uh, it doesn't support it, or I tried to convert it to a uh, float. Do, but I don't know what's happening. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's doing a memory copy as a floating point values okay. for uh, integers that get converted to floating point values. And um, but so this is this is a, a, a kind of a limitation because from from the beginning we decided to support numpy arrays with homogeneous types as the native representation for all the models, and for some models it doesn't really make sense. For instance, for random forest you could have mixed types. Uh, so one column could be a category, another could be a numerical feature, um, and uh, but right now we are converting everything to num to numbers or to one. Uh, one hot encoding of uh, categories. So it's kind of a limitation, so maybe we will relax that in the future, but uh, right now it, uh, it's expecting homogeneous representation. Uh, all right, so the models, once it's fit, you have the predict, um, the predict method, and you just pass uh, a new uh, numpy arrays with two dimensions so that has the same shape as this guy. It can have a different number of samples if you want to do a batch predictions of many samples at a time. Uh, and then you will get the uh, output prediction for each individual samples. And then you can use uh, one of the scoring metrics that we implement in, in scikit-learn to compare the quality of the predictions with the true labels and to compute the F1 score in that case for multi-class classification. So if you want to switch to a different model, uh, you can see that only the first two lines change, the import statements where you import a different Python class, and the hyperparameters uh, that you pass to, to the class. So those hyperparameters, they are specific to each level class. So here you can see that SGD classifier is from the linear model package. So this guy is just for uh, SGD, uh, uh, SGD uh, optimization for linear models. So the class name is a bit bad because now we have <laughs> other models that are also SGD trained, but nonlinear. Uh, anyway, this is a historical mistake. Um, so the, then you can try different models and, and compare the quality on held out uh, test set uh, if you want to quickly switch from one model to the other. So for instance, you also have a random forest classifier where the, the hyperparameters, you can just put a lot of trees and generally that works better. So uh, here, this is a representation of three different classification data sets in two dimensions to get some intuitions. So here you can see you have uh, the half moon data set with a bit of noise. So they are folded manifolds. Uh, this is uh, two uh, circles, uh, one uh, inside the other. And this is uh, just a hyperplane uh, with noise. And so you can see that uh, the nearest neighbors models, they can adapt, but they can overfit. Linear models, sometimes they are almost optimal here, but they are really bad at, at, at this. Uh, RBF SVM is pretty good in that case in, in low dimensions. Uh, but so the some models are good on different uh, data sets uh, depending on the assumptions, the, the, mo the data set size and whatever. I don't have to explain that to you, I guess. Uh, but um, so this is just a subset of the models that we have in scikit-learn. I think there are more like 20 or 30 classification models. So if you want to see the full list of models, you can go to the website. And you can see that the documentation is organized around uh, model families, classification, regression, clustering. There are also tools for dimensionality reduction, like PCA. We have a randomized PCA, which is um, 
a, a very efficient version of uh, PCA uh, if you want to extract uh, just a couple of components. Even if you have many samples and many features, it's very fast uh, to run. Uh, and it's uh, very accurate as well, even though it's a randomized method. Uh, there are also non-linear non uh, dimensionality reductions like uh, manifold uh, learning stuff, um, TSNE and stuff like that. The TSNE implementation is not very scalable right now. It's not the best algorithm, but uh, <laughs> it could be improved in the future. Uh, there are also model selection tools for cross-validation, <coughs> grid search, and randomized parameter search. And uh, some pre-processing stuff, like uh, scaling features, uh, doing one at encoding, um, uh, missing value imputation. It's very basic right now. Uh, and there are also uh, feature extraction tools for uh, bag of word representation for text uh, using the hashing trick or not. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, but it's a basic, a basic version. So there. They are missing stuff, but they, they can be improved. Uh, but the, t the text vectorization stuff, they are used by many people because uh, apparently not many people want to implement them by, uh, by themselves. Yes? So uh, overall, this seems like uh, you put a lot of work into it. Yeah. Uh, but it seems rather different from your day job. Yes. I'm kind of wondering what your uh, long-term plan is for resolving. <laughs> so actually, my day job is to work on the open source project. I'm a software engineer in that team. I'm not okay. doing... Uh, uh, research on brain data is just that they use scikit-learn and they hired an engineer to maintain the project, to help maintain the project. But we are many, many contributors to the project. Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I've, yeah, I don't know how many people so are contributing. just keep working on this? Yes, for the time being. <laughs> yes. Yes? Uh, sorry, I did For a uh, predict method? So it's it's more like an information retrieval way of casting prediction. <laughs> no, it's not true. <laughs> no, but uh, for for your problem, I think you're you're asking for uh, nearest neighbors classification or. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. So basically, the most of the models, when you you give them uh, multi classes, if they don't, if they are not naturally uh, multi class models like trees, for instance, or naive Bayes classification. Uh, they will they will use the one versus all reduction, so they will train binary classifiers independently, and then use uh, the decision function, whatever it is, values uh, to do the argmax on that guy. Uh, right now, we don't do um, some of the models are natural um, uh, probabilistic models that output the conditional probability um, of the class membership, and so you could use that to, but most of them, they are not really good at estimating the, the, the probabilities. For instance, boosted, boosted trees, they output a probability, but it's, it's wrong most of the time. So right now, we don't, we don't provide uh, calibration tools, but in the future, we plan to implement a plot scaling and uh, isotonic regression to recalibrate any of those models to get really good probabilities that you can average and do probabilistic inference on that. Uh, so, uh, out of curiosity, um, so you talked about one against all many times. Yeah. So that's kind of the simplest canonical. Reduction. Yes. Are there other reductions that you? Uh, yes, there are others. Uh, there is one versus rest, <laughs> but it's uh, not very scalable. Uh, and there are like uh, error correcting codes, but I've never used them myself, and other stuff. Uh, but if you go to, I think it's in preprocessing. No, I don't know. I don't remember. Maybe in classification, you you will find like those reductions. Uh, you, you the yes. Singer, uh, so <laughs> for 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 linear support vector machine, we are using li liblinear for logistic regression and linear support vector machines under the hood, uh, and they use one versus all by default. For libs VM models like kernel support vector machines, they are using one versus rest by default. Uh, which makes sense 
uh, uh, from a computational point of view because uh, kernel computation is not scalable with the number of samples anyway. So if, if you <laughs> reduce the number of samples by doing many one versus one models. Uh, so when you say one versus rest, do you mean all pairs? Yes, all pairs, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, one versus, uh, oh, uh, I meant one versus one. V one versus rest is uh, one versus all. Yeah. I, I might have been confused. Uh, so are there, are there any uh, sequential decision problems like CRFs that you have? Uh, so th the question is, do, do we have sequential uh, models, uh, sequential labeling models? Or, uh, and it's not the case because the, the API that we have is not adapted to that. So it would make mean to uh, have different APIs. And so instead of uh, like having like a hybrid project, uh, we decided to externalize those kind of models into separate projects. But there are, for instance, there is SecLearn for sequential learning and PyStruct for uh, structured predictions. Uh, and there are the developers of those two projects are also scikit-learn developers, and, but they didn't want to be constrained by the uh, rigid API of scikit-learn, and they wanted to be more like experimental project to, uh, to try different APIs and see uh, if it makes sense to adopt one uh, data representation or another. To understand correctly, I think that your, uh, your pipeline API is kind of pretty strict about the way it matches examples and targets. Yes. It's a one-to-one -one list. Yes. And, and, and for CRF, you need something a bit more flexible. Than the yes. And yeah, and actually the, the pipeline API is actually too restrictive yeah. because the number of samples that you, you have cannot change. So you cannot use the pipeline to do resampling, which is a, a, strong, a very bad limitation of this API right now. We will probably refactor that in the future, but uh, I have no time to do it so far. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, you can already do like uh, unsupervised pre-training using the pipeline API and uh, restricted Boltzmann machines. It works, but it's useless because it's uh, five years old now. <laughs> it's completely out of date. Outdated. Uh, all right. So if you click, for instance, of uh, classification here, you will see the uh, list of subchapters. Uh, actually, it's not classification; it's supervised learning. So there is regression as well, and there are uh, unsupervised ones. But uh, I invite you to have a look at the website. I won't go through all of them. So now uh, I want to talk a bit on how the uh, the project, uh, the open source project, is organized. So we are using GitHub for uh, collaboration. So it's a pull request based workflow. So anybody can submit a pull request. You don't need to be. Uh, a core developer or whatever. Um, and then uh, each pull request we will uh, receive reviews and will not be merged as long as there is no uh, two plus ones by other uh, people. So it means that each piece of code that goes merged into master uh, is known by at least three different people, so to limit the bus factor problem. Uh, when we do reviews, uh, we check that the code is matching the, the conventions of the project, that the, the public API is respected, uh, naming conventions for the classes and variables are respected. Uh, we check that the test coverage is always increasing, never decreasing, so ni now it's 94% <laughs> test coverage or something like this. We check that the documentation has been updated, uh, so the documentation is both narrative documentation online, uh, but also public uh, method documentations for the parameters, uh, like the API documentation. And we also check that there is at least one example that shows that the, this new method is actually useful on, on a specific data set and to, to get some intuitions on how it's being used in real life. Um, so if you are just contributing a fix, sometimes you don't have to update the documentation because the, it doesn't change, but most of the time you have to check those four uh, attributes. Uh, we also use like continuous integration tools like uh, Travis CI to run uh, the test and also AppVayer to run the test on Windows and build binary packages for, for Windows. Um, and so we did test on different platforms with different versions of Python and NumPy and SciPy. Um, so we try to do two or three major releases uh, per year uh, plus additional bug fix releases. Uh, but last year we were quite late. <laughs> and so each release uh, has more than 100 contributors. Uh, so the last one was the biggest so far. 
So this is an overview on how the pull request page on, on GitHub looks. It, I think it's a couple of months old already. And so you see that there are a lot of incoming pull requests, more than 100, that are waiting for reviews. <laughs> so if you want to contribute to the project, it's better to review existing pull requests than add a new one. <laughs> um, uh, so when you, uh, when you click on one of the pull requests, you can see the description of, of uh, uh, what the, the contributor means to add or to fix. And we are using these keywords to, st to say that it's a work in progress. So it means that it's not fully working yet, but uh, that the contributor uh, would like to get some early feedback uh, to not write something that is completely useless. <laughs> but it's good to have a discussion on actual code so that we can be specific in, in the discussion rather than just talking about ideas. So it's good to write uh, an early pull request and to mark it as WIP. And if it's uh, if you think that, that you've reached a point where you have nothing left to do, you can switch the, the title to MRG uh, to say that it's ready for a final review for merging. Um, so in, in the GitHub uh, UI, you can see the list of commits and they can be interleaved with messages by uh, reviewers or this is a continuous integration boats that uh, compute the test coverage. Um, and so when the reviewers put messages on specific kind of the code, you get a, a snippet and you can have a, a, dis a discussion on this specific snippet. And uh, yes, at the end, if, if uh, there are two reviewers uh, that says, oh, it's ready, uh, we can merge. So we use GitHub, but sometimes we, all we, we all also meet in real life. So we organize one sprint each year. This, this year it was at Criteo in Paris, uh, and we were like 15 people or something, uh, but there are many more con core contributors. Uh, our users are primarily supported via Stack Overflow and the mailing list. We have a specific tag. Uh, there are many users who exercise themselves on Kaggle com competitions, and, so, and the Kaggle people also use sometimes scikit-learn for their benchmark. Uh, there are many users are working in, in as data scientists in uh, data-driven startups. Uh, and we did a survey like two years ago or something, this one, one year and a half. And uh, at that time, half, more than half of the users were academics, uh, researchers, postdocs, po uh, PhD students, and 40% from industry. But I think nowadays there are more people from industry, from startups or data stuff. Assuming yeah. that your main competitor is R from yes. the machine, the, the, the R from, uh, how do you think you are? You, do you think you are eating the, uh, the R market share right now? Yeah. With, uh, so uh, I think R R is still increasing. Uh, the uh, The adoption rate of R is still increasing very fast, but there are many people coming to Scikit-Learn that have a R background. And I guess that it's less the case in the opposite side. <laughs> but uh, I don't know exactly. But uh, I, the, I gave a tutorial at Strata last year, and most of the people in the audience were R developers. There is uh. nothing equivalent to the scikit-learn pipeline in R, right? Uh, yes, the problem with R is that all the machine learning models are contributed as individual packages with different API. Yeah. There are some packages, like uh, Carrot, for instance, that have many models uh, using the same API. But I don't know if they have uh, high-level abstractions to do model selections of a family of model or pipelining of transformation, and I don't know. I'm not an R developer myself, so I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, so this is an overview of uh, startups who use Scikit-Learn for many different stuff. For instance, Airbnb is using it for fraud detection. Uh, Lovely also, it's... Uh, a bit, it's actually quite similar to Airbnb. Uh, Spotify uh, is using it for prototyping stuff for their recommendations uh, system for uh, uh, personalized radios. But I think they have a lot of in-house models as well. That Do you get any scalability information as to the size of the model, size of the data that they're using? Yeah. So the question is about the scalability. Uh, I, most models in scikit-learn, they work on in-memory data structure on a single host. So that limits a lot. But most of the time, uh, you, you can do uh, many interesting yeah. problems with that scale. So uh, for really big data, I think you need something like Wobble Rabbit or uh, MapReduce stuff. <laughs> 
but then uh, it's more complicated to, to get started. I think it's uh, Scikit-learn is very useful for prototyping uh, interactively in an IPython environment. Uh, and sometimes when you've, you, you can do that on a subsample of your full data set, and uh, then you can, based on the family of models that work well on this subsample, you can try to invest more time in, in uh, switching to a, a specific model class that, uh, that is scalable. When you say in memory, it means you are targeting multiples more than clusters? Uh, yes, because it's in memory on a single host. Yeah. Uh, so using an Empire array or a pandas data frame, for instance. Um, all right, uh, I'll switch. Okay, new stuff in uh, the last release. Uh, we've implemented, uh, improved uh, a lot the, uh, the per uh, computational performance of uh, trees, decision trees and a random forest. So we refactored the site and code base of the trees to, to better to reorganize the internal data structures to better uh, use the CPU caches. Uh, we did a bunch of specific optimizations to detect, like for instance, constant features in the, in the trees, at the end of the trees. Uh, optimized loss functions, uh, did a bit of ca internal caching, and we used uh, custom uh, a, a number of uh, generators and sort routines written wow. in C. Why do you have custom routines? Uh, because they are faster than, for instance, uh, DPRNG is a very bad uh, random number generator, but is much faster than uh, Mersenne Twister, for instance, and uh, it doesn't harm for the uh, predictive accuracy. So, and uh, for the sort routines, it's, it's just that the default Python sort routines was not as fast as, I think this is intro sort now, no, it's a, mix between merge sort and quick sort. I don't remember that uh, switches from one algorithm in the middle uh, to the other. And it, it's, it's proved empirically that it's better for, for training trees. Do you have any boosted trees, random forest, or other ensemble optimized for uh, large dimension sparse data? Uh, so in the last release, it doesn't support sparse data. Uh, but there is a pull request that has been merged or is very close to being merged that does it but in practice i think it's pretty useless because for high dimensional sparse data linear models are almost always as good as trees except when you need inter interpretable features yeah but usually the uh, you don't have much uh, non-linear non feature interactions in and also another case when you have a mixture of text and Oh uh, yeah, that that might be useful in the case, yeah. But uh, it's much more, uh, it's very costly to train a tree, whereas uh, fitting a linear model is much faster. So I'd, if it's just for, I don't know. <laughs> but it, it will be possible in the future if you want. But my colleague, yeah. Melamed, is not here. Yeah. He's the author of uh, a okay. library for a boost, uh, sparse booster trees for text. Uh, okay. Okay, so maybe maybe it's just because our implementation is not good enough to to uh, to make it work. I don't know. So this is a benchmark that was done by uh, the developer of the the trees in Scikit-Learn, and it compared uh, the trees implementation for uh, on MNIST, I think, uh, which is stupid because it's not working well on MNIST. But anyway, so this is the the fit time and this is the prediction time, and you can see that the latency at prediction time is one of the fastest. Uh, in those models, and there are OpenCV random forest, Weka random forest, R random forest, and Orange, which is another C++ library. And but yeah, it, d it depends on the data set, so it's not always as good. <laughs> and, and yes. I assume that the predictive performance is similar across. Yes, and the uh, the kind of hyperparameters are approximately match. Uh, but you can uh, it's written in in this PhD thesis. And you have the details if you if you're interested, but uh, there are other implementations like uh, H2O, for instance, which is written in Java that looks very good and scalable. That has not been benchmarked because it was too complicated <laughs> to install. Uh, but uh, and they're, they're, they might be faster. I don't know, uh, or at least they are more scalable. Um, and nowadays there is also a random forest in Spark. I haven't tested them yet, so I don't know. 
So this is another benchmark that was done by uh, a user. Um, he compared an old version of WiseRF, which is a proprietary C++ library for random forest, and different version of scikit-learn. So this was the master branch uh, before the release, actually. And he compared it to his own implementation of uh, random forest in CUDA. Uh, this implementation is, can be significantly faster than uh, that scikit-learn, but the problem with CUDA is that you have to load your data in the host device, so it, it limits the amount of data that you can uh, train um, uh, tree on. So it's not that practical in practice. Uh, but uh, you can see that it's uh, maximum twice as fast as scikit-learn. So it's not worth doing uh, CUDA for trees because you need random access in the data anyway. So we also improved uh, the memory usage of scikit-learn. Uh, for trees because we used to use multiprocessing to parallelize uh, the training of trees and so and the ways we, we were using multiprocessing was really bad <laughs> and was copying the, the data many times so instead we used uh, the we rewrote the Cyton code to use the no guild stuff so that we can use uh, our regular threads efficiently and now uh, the memory usage is just the size of the data loaded once in memory plus the size of the trees themselves. So it's the expected size, the, the memory usage. And this is also improving the, the training time performance because you have less overhead with uh, data manipulation. Is this all tree specific or is this? Uh, so the fact that we can use uh, no gill, uh, we did it only in the trees and other site on methods in scikit-learn, but not, not all of them. Yeah. Uh, most of, for instance, if you want to do grid search and train different models in parallel, you might have Python code uh, in there, so we are using multiprocessing. But we also did, I don't know if I have the slides. Uh, yep, I don't have the slide anymore. But we, uh, yeah, we have. Uh, so I also added support for memory mapping. Uh, so you can memory map the data and then pass that to the grid search and it will, uh, all the process on the same machine will uh, use the same uh, memory chunks for, for the input data. Uh, but it could be improved further, but it's, it's still much better than it used to be. <laughs> uh, there are also like tools uh, to um, uh, plot curves uh, to help you pl plot curves uh, to introspect the, the model quality. So for instance, you can plot validation curves uh, to compare uh, the ra a range of value of uh, specific hyperparameters with the, the validation scores and the training score. So for instance, this is the gamma parameter for a, a kernel support vector machine with the RBF kernel. And you can see that uh, when gamma is very small, uh, the model is underfitting because uh, actually, uh, this the, the the training score is very bad and so the cross validation score is even below uh, but then you have a, like some kind of trade-off between underfitting and overfitting of bias and variance where you can see that the the training score is is quite good quite close to 100 percent accuracy but uh, there is a small gap and that gap increases when you you change the bandwidth of the kernel and uh, then you're reaching uh, overfitting so you can also do uh, learning curves, which is the same kind of curve, but this time we're changing the size of the training set. So it's not online learning, it's just tra training a different model, uh, but on a subsample of the training set. And comparing, it's doing that many times for many bootstrap, many resampling of the data. And then you can see the impact of the training set size on the models. And you can see that for a linear model here, you can see that the, the training score is reaching a plateau here at 96% accuracy. So it means that if you are trying to collect more samples, you will be bound by this anyway. So there is no point in collecting more samples for this kind of models. So instead, you could switch to a different model that has less bias. For instance, uh, a kernel support vector machine on the same data. You can see that this time, the, the training score is close to 1% accuracy. So in that case, you can add uh, more samples to, to reduce the, uh, the variance, uh, to reduce overfitting, and you, you, you don't suffer from bias in that case, from underfitting. So I have a, a small demo. Uh, so let me s change that mirror display.
Okay. Let me increase the font a bit. So this is uh, the IPython notebook interface. Uh, so IPython is interactive <coughs> Python. It's a Python shell with uh, type completions and stuff like that. But it also comes as a, uh, a broader interface. So it's in Firefox here. You can see, uh, I will just remove that to get some space. Uh, I can add any cell here and do uh, print statements, for instance. And execute that cell and see the output. Uh, if I import uh, the stack uh, matplotlib, numpy, and scipy, I can use it uh, to do a visualization of the data. For instance, I can do plot uh, mp.random. Uh, and I, I can see a, a plot in line in my report. And you can mix. Uh, documentation, titles, figures, and all of this in the same document. And you can export this as static HTML uh, to share it over our social networks uh, to, uh, to discuss your analysis with other people online. So it's a very good tool for writing shortcut snippets for uh, interactive data exploration. But it's not meant to be an IDE. It's not meant to be like uh, some, a tool to write software. If you want to, to write uh, code for data analytics, you should use a text editor or an ID and just use that to import your library uh, to do uh, data exploration. So in this example, uh, we will use uh, Pandas to fetch the adult census data set, uh, which is a big CSV file that has, uh, actually we'll parse it and we we'll see. Um, so I it's loading this uh, CSV file as a pandas data, data structure, data frame. Uh, so this data structure has, uh, can be seen as a coll collection of columns with different types. And uh, each column has a name. Uh, so those are the names of the features. So you can see in that, that data set that the individual samples are people from the census. And you have um, uh, attributes like the age, uh, their uh, sex, race, their, their uh, education in years and kind of education, and, and so on. And one of the column is a binary column of the income, which is the target variable that we're interested in. So whether or not they are making more or less than 50K a year. And so um, we can use pandas to do basic plots, uh, for instance, a histogram of the education uh, the number of years of education, so you can see it's between 0 and 16. We can do the same for age. So you can see the distribution of the features, uh, the marginal distributions, and uh, the number of hours they work uh, in a week. And you can see that there are many people declaring 40 hours a week, even though <laughs> it's an artifact of, uh, I think, legal time. Uh, and you can sometimes also use uh, matplotlib to do more advanced visual visualization instead of using the, the built-in plot functions of uh, pandas. You can uh, import matplotlib and, uh, and slice and dice the data the way you want. So here I decided to, uh, to uh, split the data t into uh, three different subsets uh, based on the age at different thresholds, um, below 25, between 25 and, and 50 and above 50, and do uh, three different histograms for those three categories on, on the same figure. And you can see that middle-aged people uh, tend to work a larger number of weeks, whereas younger people uh, tend to be part-time uh, employees because they might be students, for instance. Um, so you, you can use Pandas, Matplotlib, and, uh, and so on to, to dive into your data and get some uh, insight just without doing any kind of predictive modeling. Uh, you can also do scatter plots. So here I'm plotting the age against uh, the hours per week. And you can see the same kind of intuition that we've seen previously. Middle-aged people tend to work uh, slightly longer than uh, young people and old people. And uh, we can also have a look at the, the target variable. Uh, so we can group by, uh, this is a categorical variable with two values. Uh, so you can group by income, and we see that uh, uh, 
24,000 people are uh, low income and uh, 8,000 8, people uh, have a high income. So it's if you are treating this as a binary classification problem, uh, you have a slight uh, class imbalance. Uh, we can measure it uh, by computing the mean using NumPy. And we see that 25%, 24% of people are high income. Uh, so le let's, um, I don't know why I put that here. Uh, so yes, uh, you can also see that in, in this data set, there are some, some values uh, that are missing using the, the NaN uh, marker here. So uh, to simplify things, I will just drop rows uh, with uh, missing values. Uh, but you, can, you could also do a uh, missing value imputation using scikit-learn if you really want to. Um, so now we just have two possible values in the target class. So I will store that, uh, that uh, target column, the income column of the data frame, as a NumPy array uh, of target names. Actually, it's just the, the names. Uh, but I will, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm just confused. I'm just using them as names uh, to, to put the legend on, on, on my plot here. It's the same plot as previously, but with two different colors for the two different kinds of people, uh, depending on the income. And you can see that high income people are, ten are working more hours per week, which makes sense. Okay, hopefully. Um, so let, let's do a predictive model. So uh, the first step is to convert the data into a numerical representation. Here, I know that I'm going to use uh, decision trees. And for this, I know that the decision trees can use uh, integer representation for categories. They are very robust to this kind of representations. For other models, typically linear models, instead of encoding categories as integers, would have been better to explode them as dummy variables uh, using the one hot encoding of the attribute and uh, add additional features. Um, so in, in that case, I, I will, I'm just using the pandas factorize function to, to, to do a, a, an integer uh, encoding. So I will uh, drop uh, the, income, um, uh, the income column and take all the other columns as features and the income columns, I will binarize it uh, whether or not it's a high income person or not. So I if I display the Y here, I can see that it's a Boolean valued uh, array, numpy array. And the features, I can also display it. It's a numpy array. Actually, it's uh, still a pandas data frame in that case. I can convert it as an empire array if I want by doing so. And you can see that there are just integer values uh, for the different categories in different columns. So um, scikit-learn provides tools for uh, models uh, evaluation. And the simplest tool that you can use is to just do a random train test split of your data. So this function will shuffle the data. You can control uh, the the randomness by passing a, an explicit seed. And you can uh, tell it the, the percentage of uh, samples that you want to keep for testing. And it will uh, split x and y as x and x test, x train and x test, and y train and y test. So in that case, we will have 80% of the samples for training and 20% for, for testing. So the, the first model that we are training here is a decision tree, a single decision tree classifier. We limit uh, the, num the depth of the tree, and we will compute the cross-validation score only on the training set. And we will do five five-fold uh, cross-validation without shuffling, and we will compute the un re-under curve of the rock curve. Uh, so let's do this, and we see that we have 80, uh, yeah, 0.88 uh, area under rock curve, uh, and this is the standard deviation uh, across the cross validation folds. Uh, we can switch, we can change the depth and see the impact. Uh, so, depth two trees already have 77, and if I have a larger depth, I can see that it's it's reaching a plateau and it's even decreasing a bit because the, the tree starts to, uh, to overfit. 
So the sweet spot between tr uh, bias and variance for a single tree seems to be around eight uh, depth. Uh, to, to have a deeper look at uh, this, we can use the learning curves function and uh, a bunch of matplotlib <laughs> uh, boilerplate uh, to see uh, the learning curve for a decision tree. Uh, so this time I didn't restrict the, the depth, so it's uh, 30. So you can see that there is a big gap between training and test accuracy. So it means that the model is overfitting. If we constrain the, the, the depth, uh, we can see that this gap is getting uh, narrower. But uh, then the, the, the train accuracy is no longer 100% that it used to be here. It's not able to fully memorize the training set. And if you reduce it further, we are reaching a sweet spot where there is no more overfitting of, of and the underfitting is not too bad either. Uh, we can also uh, plot this as a validation curve by trying different values of the depth hyperparameter and see that the sweet spot is around 8 or 9 again. So th it's the same, uh, different representation for the same intuition. So to, to reduce the, the, the variance and the bias of a single decision tree, we can ensemble them. And there are two ways, two families of uh, decision trees ensemble. The first one is more like bagging. And in that case, it's random forest. So it's bagging with additional randomiz randomization. And we can also do gradient boosting. So let's have a look at a random forest. So we are training 30 trees. We limit the, um, the depth and we compute the cross-validation score, and we see that we are reaching a 0.9 uh, accuracy uh, rock score, actually. And if we do the same for gradient boosting. Are these the best parameters for those errors? Uh, I think you can get slightly better by increasing the number of trees. Uh, just a mini course, uh, just four uh, no, two cores and uh, four hyper-threaded stuff. Don't it, minus yes. Now? Uh, yes, I do it for the cross-validation, yeah. yeah. not for the, uh, it helps a bit. Um, so I, I think you can find slightly better uh, parameters, but it will be more expensive. And so you can see that gradient-boosted trees, they are almost as accurate as random forest with, it, uh, with uh, on this data set with this encoding. Uh, but what is interesting with gradient boosted uh, classifiers, uh, trees, is that the trees are much uh, much smaller. So the model size is, uh, even the, if there are more trees, the, model, the aggregate model size is uh, smaller and the prediction time can be significantly faster also. So let's focus on, on uh, gra gradient boosted regression trees. We can uh, train on the full training set instead of doing cross-validation. Here I'm just training a single model on that. And uh, computing the, the, the test accuracy on the hold out test set. And I can see that the, the, uh, the test accuracy is the same as the cross validation score, or almost the same, so it's, it's good. Uh, we can get more details on, uh, on uh, how the model performed by uh, d printing this classification report that computes the precision and recall for each individual classes. So if this is uh, treated as the positive class, you can see that the F1 score is 0.65. Uh, and we can uh, display the, uh, the precision recall curve if we want to uh, adjust the threshold of the model. Uh, this is probably looking maybe too far ahead and I don't want to interrupt you for a long bit. Do you have any uh, ways of addressing, addressing class imbalance problems like this? Uh, kind of out of yes. Uh, so, so it depends on the models. Uh, some models, they support an additional parameter which is called class weight. And it makes, makes it possible to, uh, to um, change the objective uh, function to give more weight to a specific class, so generally the minority class. So if you put class weight equals auto, it will compute the inverse frequencies of all the classes and will just uh, use that as a weight. And most of the time it's a reasonable thing to do, but it's not always better than using the, <laughs> it depends. Um, so it, it depends on the models. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can also just, if you have many negative samples, uh, you just subsample them to, to train faster uh, with all the positive samples. But this, you have to do it by yourself. 
so, so some of the models you can also use them to introspect uh, how the decision function was was uh, built and which features are actually important to to get uh, good uh, decisions. Uh, so in, in the case of trees, you have this attribute, uh, feature importances, that is being uh, computed when the model is fit. And you can use matplotlib. Uh, mm -hmm. So in that case, we just sort the features by importances. And then we will plot the feature names from the original pandas data frame. And you can see here that based on the gradient boosted decision trees, uh, the most important feature is the capital gain and the capital loss. So the absolute values of the capital movement. And then the m number of years of education, or the kind of education. Uh, yes, because the number of years is here. Uh, the kind of occupation. And sex and race are not very uh, useful to predict the, the income, which is good. <laughs> uh, but if you train with a random forest, it's not exactly the same uh, ordering. So you, you have to take that. Uh, with a grain of salt. But uh, this kind of uh, feature importance uh, rankings is very useful when you are doing feature engineering because you can try and focus adding more features, trying to build more features by enriching the data with external data sources like OpenStreetMap or whatever and see whether it's bringing anything useful comparative to the existing features. And so if you want to, to trim a model to make it smaller, to get uh, faster prediction times, uh, you can see which features you, sh you should drop first. Uh, and finally, this is a, a, a custom model uh, that I'm just writing in, in pure Python that takes the outputs of uh, the, the trees, uh, but instead of taking the predictions of the trees, it takes a, a label, Boolean label one or, uh, one or zero for each of the leaf of all the trees. And so when you, you put your samples into the trees, you will get a Boolean encoding of a Boolean representation in a high dimensional space uh, of the original data, but based on the, the tree internal representation that was uh, trained uh, with the label. So it's, it's a supervised Boolean feature extraction model. And then you can use that to train a logistic regression uh, model. So here, so, and I will just pipeline uh, my boosted trees uh, into that transformer, make a pipeline, and, and get the output of that guy to the logistic regression, and train the aggregate model. So it's just to, to, to show how it quickly it's possible to, to adapt the models and to recombine them and to pipeline them uh, in Python. In, in this example, you, 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 you merge all the columns of your pandas, and then you run a single, a single pipeline on them. Yeah. But suppose that I, I want to run independent, separate pipeline for each column. Two examples. Yeah. An example would be two text columns where I want to have separate count vectorizer because I want to keep, to use your terminology, different namespaces. So here, I, the only way I thought yeah. to do it was to do an H stack and yes. do the training. There is no built in feature yet. Uh, so it depends if you want to train individual models on different column subsets. No, I want to, I want to do individual pre processing. Okay and then build a single big vector and then send it to a single model. Okay, so uh, to do individual preprocessing, you can use um, something which is called sklearn underscore pandas. Yeah, I tried it. That provides like higher level abstractions, but it will do a edge stack internally, so it will do a memory copy anyway. Yeah. Uh, if, uh, if you wanted to uh, avoid the memory copy, there is no good way to do it. You have to, if, especially if you are doing uh, sparse data. The, the internal data structures that we use uh, do not make it possible to. I don't know. You could you could write your own code that directly access the compressed sparse row representation or compressed sparse column, but uh, it's it's, it's not. Uh, H stack outputs a CO uh, yeah. representation that has to be reconverted. To yeah. Stack. So yeah, you you would have to do low level code to to be efficient for this kind of stuff. Um, so. Uh, so for this pipeline, we can we can just uh, train it and, and test it. I don't know if I already executed that cell, no, not yet. And compute its score on the test set. And you can see that it's slightly better than previously. And 
you can it, it was 65 i think it's now a 69 for the f1 score of the positive class uh, and we can also plot the curve that compares uh, gradient boosted trees and the uh, categorical encoding of the trees plus lo logistic regression and you can see that it's slightly improving the uh, the precision and recall so th this uh, trick was i just wanted to replicate a, a paper by facebook for we we'll advertise this trick for for um, advertisement uh, click through rate prediction and it actually works and it took me like 10, 10 minutes to, to to write the code so it's really nice to have this kind of flexibility and and to test something like this. I think it, this this trick uh, so I've used yes. this trick in the past and I think uh, it's gonna be very uh, extra helpful if you have there's some features which gradient boost decision trees just can't accept very well like mm -hmm. bag of word type features. Yes. So if you have a lot of label information. You can train your gradient boost decision tree on the decision tree like features. Yeah. Use this to extract uh, some features and then and blend that with the uh, yeah. like word features and then apply logic regression. Yes. And go to town. Yes, that would be interesting to do. Yeah. Uh, you just need to to make sure that your 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 data your input data is always uh, two dimensional, uh, like number of uh, samples and number of features, <laughs> and most of the models they expect uh, homogeneous types like floating point values everywhere. Uh, so you need to to do the kind of preprocessing in the first stage of the pipeline to convert into that representation, and then you can use most of the machine learning models like PCA for dimensionality reduction and um, some classifier or regression also. Can you, can you have uh, embedding, a pipeline embedded in the pipeline? Uh, that might be possible, yes, because the pipeline just expect that you have all these stages have a fit and transform method. And you can do whatever you want. You can plug your own code. In that case, I, I plugged my, my own uh, tree transformer here. Uh, so this class is in inheriting from base estimator and transformer mixing to provide additional stuff. But I, I don't think it's strictly necessary. I don't know. Let's try. If I just put object, it seems to work. So it's good idea to uh, to use the base classes because it's implement the score method and stuff like that or for a classifier or the fit transform method for for a transformer uh, but uh, you most of the time you just have to to uh, follow the conventions and it will work uh, if you want to do a um, uh, grid search you need to have a base estimator because you need to provide a method called get params and set params to introspect the hyperparameters and what it does, the, the default implementation that is provided in in, uh, in base estimator is using the Python introspection capabilities to introspect the constructor to, to see the list of hyperparameters. So you don't have to do any kind of um, configuration files or whatever. It's just, you know, just Python code. Yes? Um, is this example available from scikit-learn? Uh, it's not in scikit-learn examples, but if you go to... Uh, my GitHub account, so it's orgrizzle slash notebooks. It's really yes. Orgrizzle slash notebooks. So I have a bunch of notebooks. They are like mostly draft. <laughs> and uh, in Escalon demos, there there is this one. And something that is very useful when you're using wi uh, when you're working with notebooks is that you can use nbviewer.ipython.org. <coughs> And here you can put uh, the name of a GitHub repository, so uh, or Grizzle slash notebooks. Uh, because here, if you if you go here directly, it's uh, just a JSON file, so it's the internal representation of of the notebook. It's quite big, so it's uh, you cannot read it. But if you go to ipython to nbviewer ipython.org, you can see the content of my repository. Uh, but for all the notebooks, you will get an HTML rendering of, of the notebook. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I, I saved the output of the figure, so it's all in, in, in a single file. That's cool. All right. Yes? So, uh, a couple of questions. So, first of all, um, at, the, at the lower level, when you have all these different algorithms, I'm sure they 
feature of components, for instance, a lot of them require optimization. Or mm -hmm. I, I don't know how much of sampling based on yes. that. So uh, are those components really, uh, is there a common, common yes. space that is being utilized, or are they potentially duplicated? How, how does that work? So it, it really depends on the models. Uh, some of the models, for instance, uh, uh, support vector machines, they are using their third-party libraries that have been wrapped and patched a bit, uh, like LibSVM, and they have their own implementation of the optimization routine that is very tailored for this specific class of models. Uh, some other models, like for instance, we have a pull request for uh, neural nets, for simple neural nets, uh, uh, like MLPs. And for this, we have implemented our own stochastic gradient descent for backpropagation, but we also have implemented uh, a wrapper <coughs> to re reuse the uh, LBFGS solver from SciPy. Uh, so some of the models, uh, we also have a logistic regression that can use either the solver from LibLinear or uh, LBFGS from SciPy. So for some, some, some models, you, you can use a generic uh, solvers for ridge regression. I think some of the implementation are provided by SciPy as well. But it's very specific the way we, we, we wrap them. There is no like uh, uh, class hierarchy to plug a solver to an arbitrary loss function and to get the model and whatever. It's very uh, uh, specific to uh, it. So, so, so the reason I asked is, um, yes. because, okay, so, so, so I, I imagine there are basically two classes of users of mm -hmm. uh, mm. these, these tools. Uh, so probably maybe a bulk of your users are just looking for ready implementations of machine learning algorithms and uh, they're, they're more interested in actually applying the algorithms to data and yes. including parts. Uh, uh, but then machine learning researchers like yeah. me, we, we still want the custom tools because you know you don't want to sort of start yes. from scratch each time. But then because you want to actually go in and modify the yeah. algorithms, uh, you, you want to be able to sort of pull out yes. pieces still from the old implementation. I think I think I think Scikit-learn is not a very good uh, library for a researcher. Uh, if if you want to do for gradient-based stuff, I think it's more interesting to have a look if you are doing Python to have a look at uh, PyLearn 2, which is based on, on Theano. Mm -hmm. That makes it very it's very pluggable the way you can you can plug your own solver or or reuse uh, existing. And Theano makes it really easy to compute the gradient the symbolic. Uh, expression tensor expression for, for the gradient without having to derive it uh, yourself uh, for very complex objective functions if you want. So when will you be supporting some learners from Piano in scikit-learn? There's still a maturity. Yeah, I think it's not gonna happen, but uh, there there are because we don't want to add any more dependencies. We just want to have NumPy and SciPy as dependencies, but there there might be additional projects. Uh, that implements the, the scikit-learn API and so they are compatible with the pipeline grid search and cross-validation tools in, from scikit-learn uh, that would wrap uh, external uh, libraries like Theano and for instance uh, there is a project by uh, people in my lab <coughs> and a guy who has now joined ben Joshua Benjo's team in Montreal uh, which is called Eskeron Theano uh, we, but it's not for learning. <laughs> it's actually just uh, the the main uh, the primary use case right now is just to have a, a Theano wrapper to load the weights from uh, Overfit. Uh, you know, the, it's a C plus plus library for deep learning for convolutional neural net for computer vision. So they just took the pre-trained models and and rewrote the uh, the equivalent convolutions in Theano, but loading the weights. Uh, from Overfit and just wrap that as a, a scikit-learn transformer so that you can put your JPEG file as an input and get uh, high-level features to put them in the pipeline for image classification, for instance. So, but you, you can have a look at this project because they do a lot of boilerplates to plug Theano into scikit-learn models. Something that would be maybe useful, okay, so you're, you're making this difference between the, res the machine learning researcher and I'm also mm, yes. one of them, but I'm also one who should de deliver a solution to my colleagues. Yes. And I, I found that uh, Escalon is a wonderful factor for it. But the, uh, let's say, suppose that I develop some Theano code. Yes. Uh, wouldn't it be possible, uh, it would be nice for me to start from a shell, a, a kind of a, a template that tells me how to uh, export some Theano Python code 
into a second point run or so without having to kind of reinvent everything from the... From yeah, the but it's mostly writing <coughs> a class with the fit and predict yeah, method. Know, it's so simple, but uh, uh, but you, c you can have a look at this. Yeah. The, there might be good ideas and maybe generic ways to, uh, to refactor boilerplate code. But uh, yeah, so apart from... It seems like it's a general... So, so for the workshop that we had, yeah. There were a number of the projects were sort of uh, essentially research machine learning systems. Mm -hmm. While well, yours is more like a applied, a applied yeah. machine learning yeah, exactly. system, right? And yeah, and it's... And, and, and if we can make them fit together we'll better, that's mm -hmm. going to be great. Yeah. So do, do for, for instance, uh, let's let put, the, put the problem another way. I have some C++ code that I would like to wrap to be usable in Cycle. Yeah. So right now what I'm doing is that I'm looking uh, at, um, at, at uh, Cython? Um, Liblinar as a template. But Liblinar is way too complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you, can, if you can give us a yeah. simple template on how to wrap, because our C++ code is pretty trivial. It takes input and puts an output. How to wrap our C++ yeah. code that... What, what is complex with a wrapper like this is to make sure that you can address NumPy arrays. Yes. Correct. Directly, and that you have your C++ uh, buffers that match the layout of the NumPy arrays or the SciPass parse matrices. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the tricky part, and this is specific to each individual project. So I don't think there is a good generic solution, but definitely the uh, the SVM wrapper is very complicated, <laughs> very complex. So uh, yeah, I don't know if there is a better example. I have been through it, so I can't yeah. do it. But uh, yes. somebody else will have to go through it again too. So it's yeah. I think it would be nice. Happening. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but if you want to contribute at such <laughs> templates, <laughs> yeah. I'm not a C++ expert myself, so. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much.